Okay. So it's a weird question for Maria. Um, I have several of your cookbooks. Love making the stuff. But I wanted to ask, is there any information on high altitude cooking? So I'm, I'm from the Littleton area in Colorado, and um, I read all the advice on the bread and, <laughs> and try to follow everything you say, and, and um, everything else turns out wonderful. But that thing, I'm like, maybe it's altitude. Well, I want to thank you for your support and love. Um, I would say, does it fall? It, it, yeah, it starts out, starts out nice and huge, and then when it comes out of the oven... There's a couple things. Um, if there's any moisture in the bread pan when you put it in there, it will fall. It's a meringue, you know? So if you pull it right out of the dishwasher, which I've done before, and there could be maybe little pebbles of drops of water, that will cause it to fall. If you have a spatula that has any drop of water on it, that will fall. If your house is a little humid, that will fall. Um, whip it. I would say five more minutes. There's a lot of warnings about over whipping the whites. However, um, I've never incorporated that problem. I've gone into the shower whipping those whites on a stand mixer and kind of forgotten about it because um, I have a pantry that I can shut the door and I don't hear it and stuff. It's I've whipped them for about 18 minutes and they don't fall. Um, most of the time, when if you under whip it, they'll get to be almost like a sponge. Um, and then do not cut it. Let it cool completely in that bread pan. Um, I'll even put it in the fridge to allow it to cool overnight before slicing it. So those are just a couple tips. But thanks again. Okay, thank you. Um, feel free to come up and ask questions. Um, I'd like to ask Laura what's the state of play with other people doing research on low-carb diets and the effect on health, particularly diabetes? Are there other people working in the field? And uh, are we starting to get a consensus on this? Um, can you hear me? Um, so as I said, I did an informal meta-analysis of 17 trials that have already been done on very low-carbohydrate diets for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, so lots of research has been done. Um, I know Steve Finney's group with Verda, they're doing a trial right now that's not randomized, but that's assigning a whole bunch of people with type 2 diabetes to a very low-carbohydrate diet. Um, I'm not sure who else is doing it right now, but I know that there's been a lot of research. Um, I don't think there's a consensus in the field, though, that a very low-carbohydrate diet is the most appropriate or ideal diet for diabetes. There's still a lot of concerns from people about maybe long-term health effects um, uh, and cholesterol levels and whether or not it's too extreme and can people follow it. So um, I think there are still, still issues in the field. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. Oh, yeah, my name is John Ingates. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I have been on a ketogenic diet for maybe a month, month and a half. And um, I've noticed when I forget to take some salt, and my you know I crash kind of in the afternoon, uh, or even even have a hard time sleeping sometimes. But I don't know how much salt to take, and I don't know how how to you know sort of do it. Is it one time a day? Is it all day long? Is it you know, regular kind of a thing? And any advice on that would be helpful. Do you do you train or work out at all? I do, uh, three days a week, uh, about an hour. Of resistance training and uh, not a lot of cardio, not a ton of that, but just uh, even the resistance training. I find a, that a lot with my athletes in my gym, and I've told them to just be very reactive to it. So if you know you're going to train about a half hour before training, I'll say have a, a cup of broth, and it's the high, it's the sodium that you want. Um, so because you get a drop in blood pressure otherwise, because you can sweat it out pretty quick, you can only really hold the sodium at a blood level. So um, a cup of broth half hour before training. And I noticed that some of my really lean athletes will need another cup of broth later that afternoon. But a lot of times that's just in the beginning. Now that's not saying that, I mean, well, of course everybody's different. So you can find your path and some people train harder and some people's macro ratios are a little off. You know, there's a couple different camps on how we react to that. So my, I always tell my athletes just be reactive to it and 
after a while, sometimes you need it, or maybe uh, you know if you have a really intense session coming up, you do it. I'm also a big believer in um, a slow-release magnesium to help with muscle contraction as well, too. So yeah. just a, a follow-up on the broth. Is, does it add anything over just plain salt? If I just put sea salt in my hand? And you know what? I, I, maybe it's just because I like... I, oh, you want it? Yeah, can I touch on Yeah, go ahead. Um, broth does contain a lot of L-glutamine, which is going to affect people that are extremely sensitive to carbohydrates. Uh, it will take you out of ketosis, and I would say stick with salt in that case, just for, for that when um, I work with people when you're studying you know, the ketone levels and things like that. Um, it would be best to just do the salt instead of the broth just because of that high levels of L-glutamine, which can be great for building muscle, but it's also going to um, affect your fat burning if that's why you're working out, which most people yeah. it is. Okay. What's your favorite? Salt? Yeah, you said you had one. Oh, I like the... <laughs> Thanks for... I am a salt so I really like the mold and flaky salt, especially on eggs. It's just... Um, and you can get that on Amazon or wherever. Um, it just gives it a nice texture, too. Um, and I just got salt or an omelet from the, this Blue Moon Cafe, and I was like, man, where's the salt? It's, like, so bland, but I'm used to really salting it. So okay. I didn't mean to interrupt your broth no, no, comment. The sodium, is what... <laughs> the sodium is what you're after. Yeah. Okay, and, and I know there's all kinds of different fancy broths out there and stuff, different ways to make them, and salt. and So you just salt your food, or do you make, like, a drink? Add it to the water, just because I like to work out in a fasted state. Mm -hmm. If it's for work, you know, right. burning fat, um, but then just adding it to the water before you work out. Quite a bit, um, you know, I don't like to taste it, so just to the point where you're not tasting it, but... Okay. I've been doing a quarter teaspoon in the morning and a quarter teaspoon in the afternoon. And you think more than that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah, try it. Thank you. I've also experimented with a prescription drug from England, which is actually just wax and salt called slow salt. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very hard to get in America, but mm -hmm. um, it's slow release salt. And so therefore it doesn't spike your sodium. Um, and it lasts instead of, say, a regular salt tab, which might, or salt in the water, it might uh, last for maybe half an hour. This lasts for more like two hours. Thank you. Um, and just a, as an aside, um, uh, if, you have, if you are aware of having any kind of bone density issues, um, you have to be aware of the sodium displacement of, of calcium uh, as well. So there's lots of research out there that an excess of sodium for your physiology, if you do have bone density issues or osteopenia, for example, can be detrimental. So it's worth bearing in mind that it's not a, a one-size-fits-all prescription. Take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> thank, you, thank you all. <clears throat> um, I have a ketonics unit, and I wonder whether you would do a live demonstration of how to do it properly. Um, and I also do one on YouTube. I think it would be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will have a, a workshop out, out there oh, by, you will? by the table okay. so we can, I can coach you okay. one to one. Yeah. I got a YouTube video on how to use it too. You do? Yeah. We were just talking about some of the some frequently uh, issues people have with them. Uh, <laughs> uh, this question is for Laura, and I'm uh, interested in if you make people aware of the potential keto flu period, the transition period, and also if you found that there is some, if you're, if you found that there's a, it would vary on an N equals one, but a, some kind of three week, month, or two-month period where people start saying, wow, it's getting so much easier on the low-carb mm -hmm. side. My, I didn't believe this, but I no longer crave my formal cravings, if that's some of the feedback you've received. And this other question, because um, I've been uh, now low-carb about four years, and it's something I still struggle with on a daily basis. And it's more a personal question, so no one has to answer if they don't want to. 
but how you um, manage people close to you that you're not able to reach when you're maybe able to reach people in your professional capacity. And you don't have to answer that, but I know as people go on in their health restoration journey, that is something that will be quite common. And I don't have any good answers for that, but if anyone wants to share. Okay, I think other people could probably answer the question about the keto flu and cravings too, because you've seen people transition a lot. But um, I talk about potential side effects and how to deal with them, such as adding extra sodium and water before you work out, especially um, magnesium, slow release magnesium can be very helpful for, for cramps. Um, and so I have pages of handouts and discussions about um, how to deal with potential side effects. We also have a slow transition to the ketogenic diet, and I think that may help, I'm not sure, um, in terms of reducing the, uh, the flu. For some people, it, it's, it can be really hard on them, and other people, they really don't have much of a flu. Before I move on to cravings, anybody else want to talk about keto flu? Responses? No? Okay. Yeah, that's an individual basis. Like we mentioned with the athletes, definitely it's going to be I find nine times out of ten it's the sodium thing. They feel that drop in blood pressure and they're yeah. just... Yeah, yeah. so sodium is really critical for the keto flu. And then in terms of food cravings, yeah, I hear it all the time that people's cravings have changed. And in fact, there is research that um, if you go on a low-fat diet, you stop craving fat as much. If you go on a low-carb diet, you stop craving carbs as much. So I'm not sure what's going on there physiologically. But um, I tend to think at least with a ketogenic diet, your body stops seeing carbs as fuel. And so you maybe potentially stop seeing them as something that your body wants. But yeah, I think a lot of people tell me about how they kind of have their mind back. Like a part of it used to be dedicated to thinking about food and food cravings, and that part's just silent now, and they really like that. It's an unexpected benefit. Um, so, and at, and for people who still have the cravings, um, I suggest that they maybe make low carb cookies or waffles or whatever, have low carb um, or uh, you know sugar free Jello. It's not an ideal thing, but if you can eat a low-carb food that's not going to spike your blood sugar um, and deals with your cravings, it could be fine, potentially. So I don't know. Anyone want, else wants to talk about that? Oh, All right. Good. So, yeah, um, I like, I'm going to steal Maria's line. I, too, am an addict to, to treats. Um, I started out, I don't know if you got to see my presentation, as a 250-pound power lifter that was on this uh, eat everything in sight diet. And I found across with the clients that I help that it's, it's individual, okay? So if you came from that standard American diet where you're eating a lot of your meals right out of a gas station, it's going to be different than from someone who maybe grew up on a farm and was very close to paleo anyway. There's a lot of good resources out there. And I understand the argument of try to eat just real food as much as possible, but I also understand the treat argument. You know, there's a lot of us that are conditioned to it. And if it means failing versus, you know, not failing, you know, there's, Maria has a ton of awesome recipes in her books. Um, there's companies popping up, Keto Cookie. Those are delicious if you haven't had those. Those are a port in a storm. Uh, Quest Nutrition makes peanut butter cups that are so good that you would probably fight someone for them. Um, those things, it's, it's individual basis. It's very Pavlovian, too. Think about how when you're a kid uh, growing up, you go to Disney, you don't have to work, you've got all these treats. It's exciting, it's fun. So when you come home and you gotta go to work and you have a bad day, then you're programmed for these treats, but you've been diagnosed type two diabetic and you need that port in a storm. Uh, you can go onto Maria's webpage, get a great recipe. You can, uh, like I said, Keto Cookie Quest Nutrition and there's some other brownie companies out there. Um, those are a port in a storm and I think they're useful tools uh, to help you guys transition and find your way. Does that, make, does that help? Um. <clears throat> I, th I think we we need a longer term view on all this because the one thing I see uh, both as a practitioner and somebody who transformed their lifestyle from being very sick uh, is that all the blogs that I read, all the social media posts I read tell me how easy this lifestyle is supposed to be and it isn't. I mean we need to be honest about this. You know, you get, you know, oh yeah, just try this for 30 days and your life is transformed and everything's rosy this part of you know gold at the end of the rainbow and it's like no it's a day it can be a daily battle to make the right decisions and most of that is because our environment <laughs> is such that you know dictates that what is appetizing you know why you know it's more comfortable to be sedentary it's we want a, a life of convenience 
And I think if we were actually honest up front and said to people, this isn't just going to be keto flu for a few days and then everything's going to be fine. You know, this is a lifelong journey. It's a lifestyle, which means you may have dips that last more than one or two days. You may have months where you're just like going on a carb fest. And so, <laughs> um, so for myself, I lost my, I lost my sister last year, um, 39 years old from cancer. And living a paleo lifestyle for, I mean, it's now coming up to, you know, 14 years or so now, I've been pretty rock solid. I'm never, I don't even do paleo treats. I'm like hardcore paleo, <laughs> you know, um, and very evangelical about it. But I tell you what, when my sister passed away, you know, I became a sedentary, you know, I like started eating the foods that I was like, <laughs> I don't know why I'm eating this, but I, I want to eat wheat again. I want to eat cookies again. I'm going to eat dairy again, which I have issues if I have dairy. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do this sort of stuff. And it took me a long time to break out of that cycle. So I was like thinking to myself, if I, after more than a decade of pretty much living this lifestyle perfectly, can slip, <laughs> can backslide in this way. Um, and there weren't many people I could talk to about because if they usually see my persona or they, re they, they know me, they'll say, no, daryl has got it all dialed in. Do you know what I mean? So the way I came back out of that um, was basically changing my environment. And I recognized that it's my environment which dictates what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I've got to set up my environment to ensure that I don't fail. I'm less likely to fail. Um, that's what I have to do. And so where I live has to be an environment where I'm more likely to be active, <laughs> you know, so, because I can't just, um, I may not be able to go to the gym. I may not be able to do my 30 minute workout. So if I have an environment around me, that means I can just move around a bit more. That's great. If I make sure my pantry doesn't have any of those treat foods, because if I have a treat, I'm unlikely to just not have one cookie. I'm going to have the entire pack. I'm not going to have one slice of cake. I'm going to have two cakes. You know what I mean? So I, re <laughs> I recognize I'm that type of individual. And so I had to make sure that I had a fairly sanitized environment. And I also now have the advantage of when I am speaking to my clients and when I am speaking to those close to me, um, there's no judgment anymore because I'm like, I'll tell you one thing, this is not easy. And anyone who tells you this is easy is kind of lying because we've been here, how many years have we been at these conferences? And we meet people who are struggling and they know it all. They've listened to all the podcasts, they've read all the books, they have a PhD in nutrition, <laughs> you know, they, you know they, they do this stuff, they know this stuff, but the implementation is difficult. So anyway, that's what I feel we need as a community as a, and as a tribe to really make progress, to say, if this is really lifestyle change, then it requires more than a 30 day challenge. It requires more than, you know, getting over something for a few days. So that's my two pennies worth. I, I wanted to, as the researcher in the room, I have to do my duty to mention Brian Wansink's work, who he talks about changing your environment, um, specifically about food. And he's got a couple of really well-researched, great books of Brian Wansink. I also wanted to talk about not reaching everybody in your environment, just to briefly discuss your last question, um, which is that I, it, I lost a friend who I couldn't convince to change. He had diabetes, and I... I couldn't touch him and he died in his early 40s of cardiovascular problems related to his diabetes. And it's really frustrating. And I, so, yeah. Um, so it, it, you, can't, you can't motivate people who don't want to be motivated. Um, and that's actually something I'm trying to work on with my PhD student is, I think that's actually a lot harder than giving someone who's motivated, teach them how to do keto. I know it isn't easy, but I, it's, it's, it is very hard to get to someone who really doesn't want to change. So that's true. I mean, I fight my internal tubby every day, you know, I do, you know, and you can backslide and when you do, it's total carb shark. You would not believe, I mean, I consider myself a keto paleo elitist and not everybody starts there, you know, and, and everyone's going to find their way. But yeah, I agree with Daryl. I mean, I, I went off once or twice too, and I was complete carb shark. I just went nuts. It was like, because I understand the metabolic pathways, which made it even worse. So I'm like, I, you know, what's the difference between an apple and a donut? I'm having the donut, you know, at this point, um, especially factory farm apple. But anyway, um, no, I completely understand. I completely understand. It's not easy. And also, you, can, you, you also know how easy it is to get back to where you were. 
So you have that like, oh, it's okay. If I sleep for a few days, it's not a problem because I go back to my perfect lifestyle and, and everything will be, my health markers will be back to where they were. And unfortunately, that may not necessarily be the case. It may not be as easy as the first time you made that, that uh, lifestyle change, um, that transition. So yeah, I, I would love to see more bloggers and spokespersons talk about how difficult uh, this is. Because my family, who I'm constantly trying to reach out to and saying, hey, you know, I found this, uh, I found a way, I found, I found this amazing way for us to be healthy because we've all struggled with health. This is the way. I know that me evangelizing about it doesn't, doesn't help. Me sending them research doesn't help them. Um, um, and me telling them how easy it is. Oh, just do this and everything will be fine. When I started to say, hey, you know what? No, this isn't easy at all. It's really difficult. But I really recognize the benefits are long term. The benefits for me are not today or next week, but when I'm 60 and 70 and 80. That's what I'm trying to realize and for my kids and my grandkids and, and so on. So, yeah. I uh, work with a psychologist that um, we talk about if you're an extrovert or introvert, the more of an extrovert you are, no matter what diet you're on, it's more difficult to stay on because you, you know, you're socializing and even in this environment, I'm an introvert and, um, I have no problem shutting off social media or television and seeing, you know, pizza hut to, you know, commercials and stuff like that at 9 PM when, oh, I'm not hungry, but you know, that made me hungry. Um, but even like being out in social events when, everybody else is eating and drinking and that type of stuff um, makes it more difficult. So not that I can force you to be an introvert, but just thinking in your head like, oh, it just, it just, it does make sense, you know, with any diet. Um, but I wanted to touch about, um, my family thinks I'm the craziest person in the world. Um, it's about them. It's not about you. It's about them. They don't want to accept it. You know, I'm comfortable with my lifestyle. If I trigger them, it's about them. It's not about you. And you kind of have to accept that. That look at you. You look fantastic. They're triggered, you know. And also, yeah, yeah, quickly, sorry, I don't want to hog the mic, but um, I think also some of us celebrate uh, the punishment aspect. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm now a monk. You know, I now follow my Ten Commandments of Keto and look at my blood results and I'm going to go out to the, and share this knowledge to the rest of the world. And, um, and people don't respond well to that. People respond to me when they see that I'm, I'm actually enjoying my lifestyle like never before. When they see me and they say, they don't say to me, oh, Daryl, you look great. It's when they say, like, what's happened to you? You're like, you're, you know, you're just radiating and you're so passionate about what you do, not because you're trying to convince us, but because it, you just are. And so people need to see more of the enjoyment of living this healthy lifestyle. And if you look at the, like the blue zones around the world that the people often talk about that don't have, don't live perfect lifestyles, don't follow the template that we prescribe in terms of nutrition, but they live long and healthy lives. And one of their prescriptions is that they, they just enjoy, they enjoy life. They want to live a long and healthy life. And I think some of us forget that because we just have to stick to the rule of law, <laughs> of keto law. And we forget that there's far more to life than following a prescription if you're not in, you're really uh, enjoying it. Exactly. I want to say my husband, um, love him dearly, but he never lived the ketogenic lifestyle and I never forced him to. He brewed his own beer. People say, oh, my husband's never going to do this with me. Um, he brewed his own beer. We would go out to dinner. He'd order, you know, French fries, dessert. Even though I was totally keto, I never nagged him. I didn't want to be that wife. And he is more extreme than I am now just because <laughs> I lived by example. You know, instead of nagging him and like you said, you know, just like kind of telling people what to do, just leave by example. He's like, you've transformed your life and I want to become that too. And he's, he's amazing, so... I'm really jet-lagged right now, so I hope I make sense. <laughs> Maria, you talked about um, cold therapy and you also believe in sunshine. I was just wondering how that can help, particularly with people with insulin resistance. Just a brief outline. 
A lot of times we focus just on food or even just on, you know, food and exercise. Um, when it comes to the health of your mitochondria, it's much deeper than that. So there's cold therapy, light therapy, grounding. Um, a lot of people think that you can um, change the pH of your blood and it's more about can you negatively or positively charge. Um, we're all like little energizer bunnies. Um, we're made up a bunch of cells and in every cell there it's it's basically a mitochondria. That's where you oxidize fat and um, that's where we get energy from and that's 99% water and it's easy water. So that gets into a whole like another level but water can be negatively charged or positively charged. Um, like being cold, we're always in an environment where we're in, you know, 70 degree either heating or cooling buildings. We never push ourselves to be cold or hot. Um, and when you make that, the, the water in your cells, a different temperature, that's when you're in grounding to the earth, the earth has, you know, charge and, but we're always wearing shoes we're, and we're in cars and we're, you know, we're never touching the earth, you know, especially in the winter time, it's hard to, um, but just by touching the earth, you can change the charge of that cell. Um, and so there's a whole nother part to healing your mitochondria, which is where you oxidize fat. And, you know, that's where it comes into, you know, how you, with insulin and diabetes and things like that, but trying to negatively charge your cells. It's really kind of deep. I get into it with that cleanse. And you talk about 30 days. I only call it a 30 day cleanse just because I want you to feel so unbelievably good that you keep going. But we're all about short term. So that's just why I, I don't know if you're referring to that, but no, oh, okay. <laughs> it definitely wasn't a personal attack at all. I have a thirty. Oh, okay. I have a thirty-day challenge myself. So. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, it, 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 it worked. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's we're younger term. than you are, mate. Yeah, so we're still in our thirties. Um, so <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's it's a great point, um, and especially coming to a conference like this where most of our discussion is going to be around nutrition. Um, we forget about the other components and tenets of health, um, you know, and, and, and sunshine and, you know, uh, following our circadian rhythms and the natural, and the laws of nature. Um, and, you know, again, we do see evidence of those around the world who are in more, more, living more in accordance with nature, who have very healthy lifestyles, even though they're making choices that we probably would frown uh, against. And for myself, living in the UK, for example, um, and being of African descent, I, uh, I was deficient in vitamin D um, <laughs> significantly, and I am pretty much all year, all year round. Um, and believe it or not, I used to, to wear sunscreen even in the UK summer, like really, <laughs> because I believed conventional wisdom uh, around that. Um, and yeah, so I'm like, hey, I need to travel and get some, get some sun. Um, I need to work out outdoors and, and ground and wear barefoot shoes if I'm not actually really barefoot and I need to focus on my sleep quality and I need to work my core temperature so I probably didn't have much access to the cold based on my ancestry <laughs> um, so but I'm, I am aware that if you are regulating your core temperature when it comes to exercise if you're sweating profusely when it's hot outside and your body's trying to regulate homeostasis you are burning more calories you are burning more body body fat your body's constantly trying to take you into that position of Everything is okay now. So we do need to be getting outside of these temperature controlled, flawless, perfect environments. Um, and hormesis, uh, you, you may have read an Antifragile, but there's a book called Antifragile by um, Talib, uh, Talib, Nassim Talib, thank you very much. Uh, that's a fantastic book because it basically teaches you that uh, health comes by short-term stresses. So getting cold, getting hot, uh, resistance training. If you do the same type of resistance training all the time, your body no longer benefits from it. Um, if you're doing aerobic work, if you're just running the same distance at the same pace, your body goes, <clears throat> you might as well just be sitting down and doing nothing. Um, and it's the same with all other aspects. So Antifragile is a fantastic book uh, talking about all of these, uh, all of these uh, areas of, of optimizing your health. Okay. 
hopefully mine is a, a short and easy question because um, I went to your session, Laura, and um, you know I started thinking. I have a, a friend who visited with me, and we got to talking about diet, and she was really interested. She's like 300 pounds, and she's my age, so she's she's up there, but. Um, you know, this little thing, am I eligible? Because this is a virtual kind of thing. And the thing is, I don't know if she is diabetic. Do you have to be diabetic to be in this? It um, so you're talking about my study, which um, it's at succeedstudy.org, and yeah. I'm recruiting people with type 2 diabetes. Oh. I actually mail people an A1C kit if they're not sure. So oh. I, I measure their A1C, oh, so they don't okay. have to know what their A1C is. Um, so it's age 21 to 70, a BMI of 25 to 45. They don't need to know all that stuff. They can okay. just go online and fill out the survey, okay. and then I get in contact with them. Yeah, because she's having trouble staying motivated because mm -hmm. she's – all by herself. Yeah. And, you know, I try to, you know, we've been emailing back and forth. I felt like, feel like I'm a therapist, yeah. but, and, and sometimes she flags and sometimes she's, you know, right. gung ho. And, um, I, I bought, I actually sent her, um, Maria's 30 day cleanse cookbook mm -hmm. and she really, really likes it. But I was thinking something like this would, you know, would be yeah. a really good so thing. So send her my way to succeedstudy.org and just have her fill out the survey if she's interested. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I had a question, I guess uh, Jamie might be the, or uh, uh, Daryl might be the most likely to know the answer. Uh, do you all use uh, heart rate variability at all with your athletes? Uh, uh, Dr. Gervitz at, uh, uh, in, out in California has done a lot, he's a psychologist, done a lot of studies on how uh, overtraining can be avoided by monitoring your heart rate variability. And I understand now most of, uh, a lot of sports teams in uh, soccer teams in Europe, they're all uh, uh, judging how hard their athletes should train by their heart, morning heart rate variability reading. And it's also good for a lot of, to train your, uh, your autonomic nervous system and you can treat a lot of uh, autonomic diseases like you know irritable bowel syndrome very successfully with, uh, uh, with, uh, by breathing at the rate that will lower your heart rate variability the most. Do any of y'all have any experience with that? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't train for performance, um, so probably not the best to, to, to answer that question. Um, I, have, I have done uh, some heart variability work just to kind of find out what it is and, and what, the, what the personal impact is. Uh, I feel that if you have, my personal take on this is, if you have a movement practice which naturally goes from both extremes, i.e. very slow, purposeful, mindful movement, where you're focusing on diaphragmatic breathing, where you're focusing on, on constantly being in the moment, and then you swing right through to the other end where you're going to be having those moments of very high intensity and vigorous activity, and you're having constant flux between all of those modes, I think it's very unlikely you will overtrain. That's my, that's my personal take on it. And I use a very simple uh, mechanism to see if I'm overtraining or if I'm unfit for, for working out hard on a particular day. I just actually monitor my resting heart rate in the morning. And there's some good evidence that uh, if your resting heart rate is like, say, 10 beats per minute more than your, your baseline, then you know <laughs> there's something going on. It might be lack of sleep, it might be being overly stressed, it might be physical uh, micro trauma. I you know, don't train hard, hard and heavy today. And that's what I, that's what I use. Um, and I, my resting heart rate now is, I'm like 34 beats per minute resting heart rate. Yeah. And I, do, and I don't do any endurance work, just to let you know um, at all. But, but, I, but if I have a morning where I'm like 45, 46, I'm always like, okay, what's, what's going on here? I'm going to dial things down. So I do believe there's benefit, but there are also very simple ways of, of, of tracking that without spending lots of money on esoteric equipment or but monitors. Heart rate, to be fair though, heart rate variability and heart rate are inversely correlated pretty much. So it's a, it's sort of a poor man's metric of heart rate variability, which gets you probably 80% of the variability. Yes. And yes. And, and of course, if I was a performance, if I, if I was an athlete, then I wouldn't just rely on what I use as a crude, uh, crude mechanism, but it, it kind of works for me. And I, um, I always remember hearing a story of somebody who worked, he was, I think he was in the SWAT team 
um, and he once he was he was basically talking about he once did a, a heavy leg day. He did some like heavy squats in the gym, and then he <laughs> he was basically walking out of the gym, kind of like going, I can't even walk up and down the stairs because I had a great day. And then he was called out to action, and when he jumped out of the the, tr the, the van, um, he literally just collapsed. And so I always remember from hearing that story that I want to be always ready to do whatever I need to do physically. I don't want to be so crippled by my training regimen that I can't actually <laughs> do something I need to do, you know, in terms of on demand. So yeah, so I, I think uh, from performance point of view, there's obviously lots of benefit with heart rate variability. Um, but from the average Joe and Jane, like most of us are, um, <laughs> You know, just make sure you're having a wide repertoire of movement practice. So you're, you're like, like, less likely to have repetitive stress injury. You're less likely to have, um, uh, you know, a lack of motivational issues. Um, and you're more likely to have natural, really good natural recovery patterns. Yeah, just to kind of build on to that, I, I agree 100%. When I was just strictly a power lifter and had no variability, I found myself a lot, like, like Daryl said, very, very limited or very setting myself up to be in that position when I got older and I started looking at optimal health and eating and changing and wanting to be able to play with my kids and run up 74 flights of stairs at the water park, all that kind of stuff. And I couldn't be saying, oh, it's heavy leg day, daddy, and going up those damn stairs today. Um, I want to, like you said, I always want to be good to go, you know, and, and my training does vary. It comes up and down. Now I, I don't pay attention to any type of heart rate or, you know, I don't monitor anything, but um, my training is very ebb and flow. You know. Oh, um, how do I how do I keep it in check, so to speak, so I don't overtrain? Um, for me now, it's just been years of experience. Um, and there's other variables, like Daryl said. So I don't know that you can say one program, this is exactly how I do it, because you have stress, or you didn't sleep good, um, or you're all of a sudden, yeah, jet lag, or you're all of a sudden, you do fall off the bandwagon with your diet. I have a program, I have a cookie cutter starting play, point where I start with all my athletes. But if someone comes into me and says, I'm stressed out at work, blah, 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 that that diet and exercise is going to look different than the guy who, you know, is really laid back and doesn't have a lot of stress and has access to really good foods versus someone, you know, vice versa. It, I can't give you a, this is one size fits all because there isn't, you know. Um, When I'm writing programs for clients, you know, to do the training and what is there something that I can look for to be like, you know what, I think we have done enough today. You know, I don't want you to be, you know, a couch potato tomorrow because we push too hard. What's your client base? What type, what type of individuals are they? Are you, are you training elite athletes or are they cross crossfitters who compete or what, what are they? Are they just your weekend warriors? Typically, weekend warriors or even um, people just starting out, which... I mean, yeah, I think, as Jamie said, most of that will come through experience. Um, I would say, and I'm sure Jamie would echo this, um, when I found out about uh, non-linear periodization um, um, in a conventional fitness sense, that's probably the best model to, to utilize. So basically, instead of just training one phase continuously in, until you peak, you're constantly going through, okay, I'm going to do a strength phase, a hypertrophy phase, I'm going to work on some power, and I'm going to work on some, you know, some stamina and power endurance and the like. And I think that's probably the best conventional model to utilize because there's lots of, there are lots of templates out there, lots of case studies out there that you can use as a, as a starting point, and then you can individualize. So non-linear non periodization, um, from a sports science point of view is, is probably a good place to start. And I think you've got to get your clients to write really good training logs. You know, make sure they include a, a sleep diary uh, and a nutritional diary and, you know, and a stress 
indicator. Like, oh yeah, my stress levels are nine out of 10. So there's no way if they came to me and says, yeah, my stress levels are nine out of 10 and I've just break, broken up with my partner, I'd be like, yeah, we're gonna do that high intensity protocol today, right, we're just gonna smash it. No, 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 I'm like, hey, let's focus on some breathing. Let's, do you know what I mean? So I think if you have more information from your client uh, as part of your developing your training uh, program, that's the, probably the best place to start. Yeah, I, th I think for someone who's, like I've been doing this since high school at this point, and I've worked with so many people so many times, and I'm old, um, or getting there. So yeah, communication is key. Um, a nonlinear progression, moving, uh, ebb and flow, paying attention, uh, conjugate method, stuff like that, keeping the body guessing, um, you know, not four miles an hour on the treadmill three, you know, three times a week. As, it might work for the first three weeks, but then all of a sudden your body adapts, and you know you, you got to keep a lot of communication. I probably could write two or three books on that alone <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. at this point. So let's okay, let's do something. <laughs> Hello, Hi. Um, thank you all for speaking today. Um, I'm here mostly because my son was diagnosed type one diabetic this last summer, and um, so we've been. Uh, actually, we had been following a paleo lifestyle for years, mostly on, sometimes off. Um, but when we went after his diagnosis, we're in the hospital, and they prescribe a high-carb diet, of course. And, um, and there's a lot of things that I had questions about. But one being that we had to get the ketone strips, um, and we did end up buying the ones that you urinate on. And you had mentioned that you weren't a fan of them. I didn't know if there was anything specific that I should... Um, know about that because um, that's what we have in our cupboard. And um, second question I have is um, I quickly found people that um, were successfully managing type 1 diabetes by going low carb. And we've got, within a couple mo months, really, we got his A1C from um, about 11 to 5, 5.1. Um, and it wasn't hard, again, in that we had been eating this way normally, and then they had pushed, you have to have 60 carbs at every meal kind of thing at us, and it was crazy. But um, what's been hard is that there's not a lot of support within the um, endocrinologist that we visit. And, and, um, and I did come across an endocrinologist that's open to it, but she's like, where's the studies that show, you know, that this works or... Um, Basically, she, she one one doctor was open to seeing the study. So um, I didn't know, maybe Laura, this would be more in your line, but if there's um, any studies going on or if there's ways to push studies. And the studies I've seen that are for type 1s, a lot of times it seems like you have to have a type, you have to have A1C that's pretty high um, or 7 or something like that to even qualify to do the study. And I'm more interested in people that are um, successfully maintaining health with type 1 and seeing what they're doing as opposed to always studying the people that have type 1 but have high A1Cs. But they seem not to qualify for government money if their A1C is good. So I would love support within the doctor community because it's really stressful uh, right already. So going in there and not knowing, you know, like I believe this has to be right. He's feeling good. You know, his numbers are good. He's growing. Well, they're always like he won't grow. He's right back on his growth chart. He's a competitive athlete. Um, everything seems to be going well again now that we're back in this lifestyle. But I want the data to back it up. So. Um, I don't know if there's anything formal. I know a handful of successful type 1 doctors that are doing a low-carb ketogenic diet. And I, I know Dr. Keith Runyon does a lot of his own experiments, especially with training, which might appeal to your son. I know that the big flag that's going to go off for a lot of doctors is, you know, ketosis versus ketoacidosis, which is you have a, uh, the difference is like, so we put up, you've seen some of these screens that say 0.5 to 5 millimolars, which is something ketoacidosis would be like 25 to 50, but also it has to be an elevated blood sugar level too, because that, that's where you really get into trouble. So, you know, a glucose meter and a blood meter might be good for that. Um, but yeah, Dr. Keith Runyon, uh, Hannah Bo, how do you pronounce how Hannah's last name? Batias. Okay. <laughs> She's a very successful type 1 diabetic, and she offers a lot of information on it as well. Um, Dr. Birch, yeah. yeah, Dr. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's definitely. Right. That's the book I had read. Like, 
Yeah, so there's some resources out there for you. Is there anything formal yet? I don't I don't think so. so oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So in in a yes. type 1 grit. Yes. Okay. So I know that there are a few physicians who use uh, keto diet with their type 1 patients and there's a study going on right now where they're just collecting all of the stories from I think more than a thousand or at least several hundred people who've done this as a first step and then they do want to do the right trial and we're actually I think it's um uh yeah do you have a Oh you want to answer? Okay, let me just finish my um, thought. But when uh, so it's, I think NUSI Nutritional Science Initiative is trying to organize research on type one diabetes and uh, ketogenic diet. So we know that we need more research. This isn't my area of expertise, and so I'm not going to study it myself. But I'm, people in the field know we need more research, and they're they're on it. So it's just not there yet, I guess. I, I did see some preliminary research recently. It was probably about six months ago um, on. Um, type 1 diabetes, uh, which was known to be um, autoimmune-based, um, with a carbohydrate restriction diet, and also an um, autoimmune protocol diet as well. So they basically are following an AIP kind of pro, uh, paleo mm -hmm. diet, as well as uh, carbohydrate restriction uh, and having some success in, in children. So I, I, if, if I'll give you my card and I'll, um, I'll try to pull out that research and send you, and send you a link. Um. Can I just say something? I have a type 1 daughter, and I had the same argument at our endocrinology appointment. They said, where's the data? Where's the data? So my response back was, when her A1C has been 8.5 for 10 years, following your advice, and now I got it down to 6, I know what an 8.5 A1C does. There's tons of research on that. Right, I know. So I'm going to bank <laughs> like, on... I'm sorry. I'm going to wait for the research and give it to you. But in the meantime, this is how what we're how we're living, and that's what we that's just what we decided to do. Yeah. So, and I, just so you know, we were arguing for over two hours. She wanted me to up her. She congratulated me on the A1C. <laughs> Everything's great. Why isn't she eating any carbohydrates? <laughs> So I just so anyway, there is. I just wanted to let you know, and the type one grit that they're talking about on Facebook mm -hmm. has literally changed our lives. Mm -hmm. So I just, you've got to get on that group. I also wanted to mention that I think the reason that a ketogenic diet is especially helpful for people with type one diabetes, again, it's not my area of research, but it not only lowers A1C, but it keeps your blood sugar levels very even, stable. So it's so much easier to um, dose the insulin, right? Well, some of it, some of my concern also isn't just dealing with type 1 diabetes, but the fact that the endocrinologist or um, the assumption seems to be that you can't develop normally if you don't have high carb, just in general. Oh. And I'm like, I, I thought... <laughs> my kids were on way under the growth chart. They're from Ethiopia. They were right. extremely small, terribly small. Mm -hmm. And when they... When we pick them up, they switch automatically to a ketogenic diet. They're thriving. They're right. super. They're taller than what their birth families were. They are way on the growth charts, and our doctors are like, "Well, that's just you." <laughs> right. But yeah. they're super healthy. Like this, you know. All I can say was they they're growing like weeds, and they're very healthy. And you don't need sugar to grow. Yeah. If I could chip in, um, it's a great shame that Dr. Jake Kushner, who was to be here, he's a pediatric endocrinologist. Anyone know where oh, he's from? Houston. From uh, Houston. One of the failures. He was I skiing in Japan um, three weeks ago, and he just slipped on the ice oh. in the street in Sapporo. He has a fracture in his ankle. And uh, it's all been fixed up, but his wife would not let him come Aww. to Breckenridge. So, but he, he was going to talk it. on this very topic. Um, so, look, there are people out there yeah. who are getting it. There are also people who are getting it, uh, doctors, endocrinologists, certainly from my hometown. They're not quite ready to come out of the cupboard, but they're treating their patients um, with low carb. I think... We're getting better. Oh, the other thing I was going to suggest, last year at Vale, we did a, uh, a diabetes support group on the afternoon of, um, of Sunday. And we had a number of people with similar problems, because I'm sure there's a number of type 2 diabetes people here, and those of you with children, uh, Pete, 
um, our cameraman here in the main room. He has a six-year-old with type 1. And boy, some of you people know a lot. And it'll be great if you can connect and type 1 Facebook group. I get all their posts. Absolutely. You know, 1,500 people with type 1 diabetes, largely children. What an amazing resource. So anyway, sorry to chip in. Perhaps if we could manage one more question and uh, then we'll need to close up. Oh yeah, I might just add one point on that. There's two published case histories of teenagers with type 1 where they put them on ketogenic diets and I think up to 18 months later we're still running with no exogenous insulin. So uh, they're quite interesting. They're N equals 1 but they're they're quite fascinating to see, catching them early type 1 and maintaining them without insulin for, I think, almost two years, the second one. So that's my post it on type 1 grit, so you can all have a look. There's a doctor in Hungary. Uh, I'm going to mangle the name. Uh, there's a Hungarian doctor, uh, Kabasas Toth, and he is a world expert on paleolithic ketogenic diets. And he's caught type 1s early, early, and um, has essentially reversed, been able to have them functionally no longer be type 1. So that's somebody to, to check out as well. Hi, my question is for Maria. Um, first of all, I want to say I appreciate you sharing about uh, a ketogenic diet really helping with your depression. And um, I have a longstanding diagnosis of bipolar disorder and started doing a ketogenic diet in August of 2014 and was able to get off my traditional medicines for that. Um, but I'm having a hard time talking local psychiatrists into accepting the fact that a ketogenic diet can be my medicine rather than those nasty anticonvulsants and antipsychotics that cause so much metabolic and cognitive impairment. So I was just wondering if anybody, if Maria, if you or anyone else could kind of comment on any support for that um, with patients you've worked with or in the literature, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, a lot of my clients have had success. Um, for a variety of reasons, you know, not just how sugar is going to cause, um, you know, without that rise, you know, we think of carbohydrates as causing serotonin to rise, but you're going to also get that fall. And so that kind of manic depressive is going to keep happening. But I think it's more about the, the autoimmune response causing these issues with um, like serotonin um, so getting rid of like dairy and gluten and, you know, whatever trigger is causing this, um, getting rid of those food triggers. And that's why I call my, you know, a dairy free keto life is kind of the way we usually live. Um, we do have support on, you know, on my site if you're looking for that type of stuff, but um, if you're looking f just for yourself, but as far as published study. I mean, it's like the N equals one thing. You just have to be your own best advocate and finding a therapist that will support you on that journey. You know, your bodies, I think you mentioned it, that our bodies are brilliant. They know how to take care of themselves. We just have to give them the proper fuel for that. Um, but you also have to fuel yourself right because, you know, if you just enter a ketogenic diet and you're low in potassium, that in general can cause low moods. Um, but there was something else I wanted to touch on, and I'm kind of going blank with that. But um, I'm really proud of you for going down that journey. Um, but it does help a lot with um, even like eating disorder type of manic um, eating and um, that type of stuff too. But hey, uh, thank you to all our speakers for this morning. I think it's been a great lineup. Fantastic stuff and great Q and A as well. So uh, perhaps we could give them a round of applause for their contribution. <laughs> <laughs>